Okay, uh, so in uh, today's class, uh, let us continue our uh, discussion of uh, this system of uh, masses and springs. So, if you recall in the last class, uh, I told you that we are going to be studying, uh, you know, fields in the sense of um, having a dynamical system with many degrees of freedom, but uh, which corresponds to physically something resembling a a crystalline solid. So, so the idea was that first you uh, study a very simple system namely a mass tied one mass tied to one spring and then you generalize to a system uh, consisting of a mass uh, followed by a spring then followed by a mass and uh, indefinitely that way. So, that uh, this uh, particular indefinite uh, sequence of masses and springs alternating is basically a, a simple prototype of a one dimensional crystal. So, the implication there is the masses uh, in that model correspond to uh, the atoms uh, of the solid and uh, the springs are a metaphor or basically they signify the potential energy, uh, the the you know the electromagnetic potential energy that exists between uh, the atoms of a solid so something like van der waals perhaps so wh whatever it is that uh, uh, that potential energy basically goes through a minimum so so the idea is that uh, any potential energy that goes through a minimum uh, will be of the form of a spring uh, potential energy meaning it is as if there is a spring tied between the masses and I explained to you in the last class why that is. So, the reason why we look for a potential energy that goes through a minimum is because we expect that uh, in the ground state uh, the system that we are studying will correspond to the forces acting on the uh, atoms to be actually 0. So, that means that forces act only when you displace uh, an atom from its equilibrium original lattice position, but that force is of a restoring kind in the sense that if you push it by some distance in one direction, the remaining atoms will try to pull it back to its original location to its equilibrium location. So, there is a restoring force and that restoring force is proportional to the displacement of the atom. So, we know that uh, uh, such a force is basically a spring force. So, even though there is no physically there is no spring, but it basically corresponds uh, it is as if there is some spring uh, between the masses. So, we did all that and then uh, I showed you how to uh, basically uh, the idea was to recast or uh, rework this uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, it which was in terms of the momenta of the masses and the uh, displacements of the masses uh, in terms of uh, creation and annihilation operator just like we did for a single mass and a single spring. So, when you have many masses and many springs, so you will have uh, many such uh, annihilation and creating creation operators and because uh, the uh, displacement uh, of each mass. Uh, so, that means the uh, given that uh, the potential energy is basically stored in the spring. So, so the Hamiltonian has two parts one is the kinetic energy of all the masses that is this one and the potential energy uh, which is only in the spring, so, but the, the potential energy stored in the spring between masses at uh, j and j plus 1 is basically the difference in the displacement squared it is half k delta x squared, but delta x is basically the amount by which the spring has stretched or compressed. So, that is basically x j plus 1 minus x j. So, uh, so now the, this implies that therefore, that uh, the masses are not all independent. So, because a jth mass is pushed and pulled by j plus 1 mass which is in turn pushed or pulled by j plus 2. So, indirectly j will be influenced by j plus 2 and so on and so forth. So, they are all linked up. So, you cannot really separate them. So, that is the reason why when we write down the Hamiltonian in terms of uh, creation annihilation, we are forced to introduce uh, 
uh, an off diagonal uh, form like this. So, it would not be a dagger i a i because if that were the case that means that uh, i th mass is independent of i plus 1 because they all get separated uh, as a summation. But uh, we know that that cannot happen so it has to be a dagger i a j where j can be anything because uh, i is indirectly influenced by j regardless of what j is. So, uh, so we did all this and we, f we demanded that these two operators that is 8.4 and 8.5 have to be mathematically the same operators. So, to do that we had to introduce uh, this idea that uh, the uh, annihilation and creation operators are linear in the position and momenta. So, because they are linear the coefficients will basically be the commutators of the position uh, and the momentum operators uh, commuting with the annihilation or creation operators. So, as a result uh, you will end up with uh, uh, two eigenvalue equations as it were. So, these are the two equations 8.7 and 8.8. .8. So, now we make the assertion that uh, basically because there is a translational symmetry in the problem that means that. Uh, if you have a mass at i and another mass at j, uh, you know the forces between them or you know the properties uh, that are linked to a mass at i and mass at j depend only on the distance between i and j. It does not matter exactly what i is because you know you can always shift i by one unit to the left or right basically the system looks the same. Uh, because the system is indefinitely extending to the right and left. So, they all look the same at all points. So, it is only that if you have, uh, so there is no particular reference point. So, if you have a m mass at i and mass at j, clearly uh, the pro physical properties will depend only on the difference between i and j. So, given that fact we can always write uh, any function which depends on i and j as a function which involves only the difference between i and j. So, same with uh, j and k. So, it only involves the difference between j and k. So, and the coefficients are basically the Fourier uh, components and then you go ahead and insert uh, these uh, simplifications into 8.7 and 8.8. .8 and uh, you will end up with these equations and these equations because uh, these uh, these functions are all linearly independent. So, different q's they are all linearly independent. So, you ha they have to be term wise equal. So, the summation goes away and uh, you get these equations. So, this will tell you that basically omega has to be uh, some very specific uh, quantity. See what is omega? Omega tilde is related, omega tilde is the Fourier transform of uh, this omega. So, basically it is some kind of an energy of excitation of the system. So, because uh, you see in the earlier case there was only one uh, uh, omega as it were, so because there was only one mass and one spring. So, but here you have many possible omegas for a given q so, it is that is why it is called a field. So, you have a dispersion relation now. So, omega now starts to depend on q. Okay. So, uh, so, this is see in the earlier case for a given quantum. So, if you fix n then the energy was uh, h bar omega into n plus half. So, that omega is only one particular omega which is square root of k by m. But here this uh, this omega is not 1 omega, but it depends on q. So, you have to specify q also. q is basically the inverse of the wavelength of uh, the excitations that are propagating in the system. Okay. So, because there are large numbers of masses followed by springs, so the, uh, the excitations uh, so, even if there is one quantum there you will still have different modes basically. So, different q's will have different energies. So, it is a continuum uh, analog of one mass tied to one spring. So, it is basically a that is why it is called a field. So, there are infinitely many degrees of freedom. So, bottom line is that that is what it is. Okay. <laughs>
So, uh, so you will end up having an energy which depends on Q and where Q is basically the inverse of the wavelength of the modes that are propagating in the system. So, then of course, the, your, your actual energy of the system will basically be uh, omega Q into n Q plus 1 half where n Q is now a 0, 1, 2, 3 for a given Q. So, if if you fix Q that is if you fix the wavelength of the modes that are propagating in your system, you still have to tell me how many quanta there are for that particular wavelength. So, if you tell me that also then I can tell you what is the energy of the system, I mean of the entire system. So, that is still going to be uh, this and, and uh, the peculiar thing is that this is not h bar omega, it involves uh, the inverse of the wavelength which is q. q is strictly 2 pi by wavelength, okay. it is the in it is it is proportional to the inverse of the wavelength. So, it is basically um, it is the wave number. So, bottom line is that uh, yeah, so uh, this leads to a uh, description in terms of so if the wavelength is long that means if q is small. So, if you have modes that are propagating in the system that have long wavelength that means q is small then you will see that this approximately is uh, some constant times q. So, it is basically the energy is proportional to the wave number. So, that is typical of uh, systems like of sound waves you know. Uh, so, you know that uh, nu lambda equals c this is for both light and sound. So, then your uh, h bar omega is basically uh, uh, c into so c into h bar k. So, so this is basically your energy uh, and this is c p. So, it is basically energy is uh, speed into momentum. So, this would be the case. So, this is dispersionless excitation. So, that basically when q is small you will see that uh, it resembles long, uh, sound waves that you typically uh, uh, see in your high school textbooks. So, what is the physical meaning of q being small? q being small means wavelength of the modes that are propagating are large. So, if the wavelength of the modes are propagating are large they sort of are unable to see that uh, the underlying system is actually discrete. So, it is made of these discrete atoms that are separated by this constant distance called a small letter a. So, the modes cannot make out uh, so, lambda is much greater than a. So, they cannot make out that there are these underlying uh, discrete modes. So, that is the reason why uh, they will start to resemble this uh, continuum sound wave like description. Okay. So, that uh, is as far as uh, that is how you would go about studying uh, the um, fields that are propagating basically the. So, this is a field description of the uh, excitations uh, found in a solid. So, this is the specifically is the quantum field description. So, it is a field because you have infinitely many masses and springs. So, you have infinitely many degrees of freedom and further it is a quantum field because the underlying degrees of freedom are fully quantum mechanical. So, we studied that using commutators and so on. So, that means that we studied that uh, the modes that are propagating in the solid using quantum mechanics. So, the next uh, example I am going to uh, study uh, or uh, introduce is basically uh, very important and that is the quantum electromagnetic field. So, in the several lectures ago I had uh, explained to you the uh, classical electromagnetic field specifically I had uh, explained uh, how Maxwell's equations may be thought of as the Euler Lagrange equations of some suitable Lagrangian and we had done lots actually if you think about it we had derived uh, something called the stress energy tensor and we had figured out so many things about the electromagnetic field. The fact that uh, the equations uh, are consistent with special relativity rather than Galilean relativity and a whole bunch of other things. So, the only ingredient that we have missed uh, 
is uh, treating the electromagnetic field quantum mechanically. So, in nature, uh, of course, you know, the, this uh, subject of what really is light has a long and uh, sort of tortuous history that people were uh, thinking of light as uh, made of particle. Newton was the first one to postulate uh, that, uh, you know, light is made of particles just like you can you know, just throw a bunch of uh, grains of sand into some tube and then they will they'll carry energy, the kinetic energy of those uh, particles will propagate. So, Newton naively thought the, that that is how light is. So, of course, he had no proof uh, supporting his uh, claim. So, he just uh, assumed that because he could not think of anything else. So, but however, later experiments by Huygens, uh, Young and, and all those other uh, people who are proponents of uh, the wave theory of light, they, they actually performed experiments which sort of uh, showed reasonably convincingly, in fact quite convincingly that the uh, that light uh, exhibits the properties that you would uh, as commonly associate with waves. For example, waves, one of the characteristics of waves is that they bend across obstacles. So, if you put a obstacle here, so imagine that you uh, this is an uh, you put a wall and this is full of water here and imagine you create uh, waves. So, so imagine you create waves here. So, if, if uh, these are just, uh, you know, a bunch of particles going like this, you will not find anything here, they will all get reflected like this. But if they are waves, you will see that some of them will actually bend around and then they will even go in this direction. So, waves by nature are delocalized. So, they are disturbances of some medium that are propagating. So, even if you start off uh, creating that disturbance in a localized way, they will not remain localized, they will spread out and then they will go around obstacles. So, that is the nature of waves. So, you see, uh, the whole idea is that, uh, you know, in, in our school days, uh, we are always uh, taught, I mean, the, the way your school teachers teach you, you know, is light a particle or a wave? But the more fundamental question they do not ask is like, why should it be one or the other? You know, what is so special about a particle or a wave? You know, why can't it be a, you know, unicorn or a, or some other, why does it have to be a particle or a wave? What does that even mean? Why did they think of those two possibilities? So, of course, your school teachers do not tell you that because uh, the syllabi do not uh, mention that clearly. So, the answer to that is basically because the, the underlying uh, implication is that particles are actually localized uh, entities. That means that they exist only in some finite region and both particles and waves are carriers of energy. So, they transport energy from one location to another. But particles transport energy by virtue of their own motion, that means they themselves move and the particles are actually localized objects and if you have many particles, they are all in, in their localized positions and they collectively move and transport energy. Whereas waves are exactly opposite, so, so these are two opposite extremes, so that is the reason why people talk of particles or waves. So, the implication is that these are two opposite extremes. So, waves are completely delocalized objects and uh, because they are delocalized, they cannot be any material particles, but rather they are actually disturbances of some medium. But then those disturbances also carry energy. So, just like particles carry energy, the particles are completely localized, that means they exist in some finite region of space. Whereas, waves are exactly the opposite, they are completely delocalized 
and yet both ener both waves and particles carry energy so because light also is a phenomenon where energy is transported from one place to another it makes sense to ask is uh, light more resembling you know is light made of entities that are completely localized which then physically transport themselves to some other location thereby transferring energy from one point to another or is it completely made of or is it made of completely delocalized entities such as disturbances of some medium which then propagates and energy gets transported from one place to another so these are two extreme uh, viewpoints and uh, it's so that's a legitimate question to ask because clearly uh, it's one or the other or something in between see because it can be uh, so the physical content of uh, light can be either extremely localized or it can be extremely delocalized or something in between so that's a valid question to ask so that's the reason why uh, this question is posed in that way so um, in the time after newton so when newton was alive he was pretty much considered the authority on pretty much everything because of his stature as a result of uh, his being able to explain celestial phenomena through his theory of gravitation and uh, his formulation of laws of mechanics so people assumed that uh, he was an expert on everything else also so specifically they did not want to question his uh, opinion on what light is made of so people assumed that uh, newton has to be right because he said that light is made of corpuscles which are basically localized entities that physically propagate from one point to another but after his death uh, many uh, scientists began to critically examine those claims and performed experiments and then they realized that the truth was closer to the exact opposite of what uh, newton believed that uh, light appeared to bend around obstacles and it was able to uh, do things that you normally associate uh, with waves so for several centuries after newton's death people uh, for valid reasons understandably uh, came to the agreement that uh, light, light was made of waves but uh, in the uh, early part of the 20th century so there was this phenomenon of the photoelectric effect and uh, that Uh, seem to be completely at odds with uh, the uh, wave nature of light and also nearly simultaneously there was this observation of uh, the black body spectrum and uh, any attempts to derive the black body spectrum through uh, you know by assuming that light was a electromagnetic wave also failed miserably so these two ideas uh, immediately led to a kind of a crisis in physics and that crisis was uh, resolved by einstein who realized that uh, there is a link between these two seemingly unrelated crises and then he postulated that uh, light actually uh, the energy contained in light it's not continuous but it comes in discrete packets of course just like newton he had done no dependent reason to believe that so but however unlike newton he was not merely an opinion that he was able to explain that postulate was enough for him to explain observed physical phenomena namely uh, the photoelectric effect and the black body radiation yeah so planck was the one who guessed that there must be uh, something analogous to quanta but it uh, planck incorrectly assumed that the walls of the container are actually responsible for so uh, planck assumed that light still consists of electromagnetic wave with energy continuous so planck assumed that is the walls of the quanta that 
refuse to absorb and emit continuously. So, they absorb and emit only discrete quanta, but it was Einstein who realized that it is the electromagnetic uh, field itself uh, which is quantized. That means, the energy contained in the electromagnetic field itself uh, comes in discrete packets. And that uh, sort of a realization was enough for Einstein to explain not only black body radiation, but also the photoelectric effect. But uh, however, uh, that sort of a ad hoc assumption explaining some phenomenon is a success no doubt, but uh, that success is necessarily short lived in the sense that once uh, that euphoria, that uh, excitement of having explained these phenomena wears out, then the uh, fundamental question will still uh, surface, namely you will be asking uh, you know where did this quantum electromagnetic field come from, because they certainly do not come from Maxwell's equations, because uh, there is no room for Maxwell's equations to produce uh, discrete energy. So, you see the, the energy contained in the electromagnetic field we had derived was this. So, E can be continuously anything, E is electric field at position R and B is electric magnetic field at position R and they can be continuously anything you want them to be and the uh, total energy is just that integral. So, there is no room for making a claim that uh, the energy contained is discrete in the electromagnetic field. But of course, uh, that is only apparently because then you, you realize that um, Maxwell's uh, theory is basically classical in the sense that it, uh, it involves uh, treating uh, electric and magnetic fields as just numbers that you can measure and uh, you can just go ahead and find the energy and so on. So, what one realizes is that uh, the quantum nature of the electromagnetic field since it is necessary now, now that Einstein has told us that it is necessary to describe electromagnetic field quantum mechanically, it becomes necessary for us to find out uh, a way to rework Maxwell's equations, so that it is consistent with the principles of quantum mechanics. So, you know that how you do that in uh, quantum mechanics that basically you identify generalized coordinates and uh, you have a Lagrangian. So, that is typically how it is done. So, that is the reason why I introduce the Lagrangian. So, you typically have a Lagrangian and then you have a generalized, you identify generalized coordinates and then from the generalized coordinate and the generalized and the Lagrangian, you can uh, derive generalized or you can write down the generalized momentum. So, uh, so this is the uh, prescription that is universally followed. So, this is said even at the classical level. So, you have a classical Lagrangian and you identify a generalized coordinate with respect to which the Euler Lagrange equations of that particular classical Lagrangian results in the Maxwell equations. So, that means we have already done that, we have already shown that the suitable Lagrangian is basically E squared minus B squared uh, integrated over all space and the generalized uh, coordinate is basically the vector potential at least for the uh, electromagnetic field without sources. And uh, you can even work out the generalized momentum and uh, the generalized momentum conjugate to the generalized coordinate which we have selected to be A the vector potential is basically the electric field uh, apart from a const. So, uh, so if you uh, rewrite uh, this Hamiltonian in terms of the generalized momentum and the generalized coordinate, you end up uh, being able to write it like this. Okay. So, now this is all classical, even 8.20 is classical, because 8.20 is just uh, rewriting h in terms of uh, q and p.
right so it's uh, it's basically uh, 8.20 is rewriting 8.18 in terms of generalized coordinate which is a and generalized momentum which is pa so there's nothing quantum yet but however we now can immediately realize how to uh, study the electromagnetic field quantum mechanically and uh, what that means is that now you start pretending that uh, the generalized coordinates and generalized momenta they are not numbers but they are operators and they are operators in the sense that they obey these commutation rules so that if you look at the commutator between uh, the two generalized coordinates uh, uh, at the same time of course then uh, they are zero same with generalized momenta but however coordinate uh, commutator with momentum should be i h bar and because these are fields uh, so that uh, so it's i h it's zero if r and r dash are not the same because clearly i mean at different points they don't talk to each other and if they are the same points then the position and momentum at the same point so i told you already that you see the the position in space takes on the role of some kind of a uh, index uh, which counts the number of degrees of freedom so if you have say n number of uh, generalized coordinates you would write that as q1 q2 q3 so here this r is uh, taking on that role of 1 2 3 like that so instead of 1 2 3 is now continuous r vector so now clearly q qi q1 will commute with p2 where q is the generalized coordinate of the first particle and p is the generalized momentum of the second particle the q commutator of q1 commutator p2 is always zero so that means that unless r equals r prime the commutator of the generalized coordinate and generalized momentum are actually zero but if they are the same you should have a delta function okay so that's the idea behind uh, so the kronecker deltas naturally become uh, dirac deltas when you go from a discrete situation to a continuum situation okay so that's the thumb rule so you are uh, replacing things by you know, distributions rather than uh, discrete uh, quantities so the idea is that now we can go ahead and uh, reinterpret 8.20 as a quantum mechanical hamiltonian uh, provided we uh, make these uh, postulates that the uh, commutators uh, so you replace the generalized coordinates and generalized momenta and you uh, reinterpret them as operators obeying certain commutation rules namely 8.21 and 8.22 okay uh, so now the idea is that you see just like uh, in the earlier case we were successful in uh, rewriting our hamiltonian like this so for, so for mass tight uh, mass spring mass spring mass spring that type of system which physically described a one dimensional solid that is basically the sound waves propagating in one dimensional solid so here you have light waves propagating it's not clear in what because you see even classically uh, the electromagnetic waves are not actually disturbances of any medium they are actually disturbances of some abstract thing called the electromagnetic field and that electromagnetic field is not any physical quantity it's a mathematical construct but you have a, a abstract uh, mental construct which also uh, can suffer disturbances but in sound waves you see it is a physical uh, medium like air or so if you have sound waves in water it's the is the liquid itself that's undergoes disturbances and the disturbances propagate if it is sound waves in air it's the pressure and uh, density variations that propagate as sound waves but in case of light uh, you see light propagates in a vacuum and it does so with greater speed than when it is uh, propagating in a medium so the question is that how can it propagate in a vacuum 
because there is nothing that is getting disturbed. Vacuum by definition is the absence of matter. But then absence of matter does not mean absence of things that can get disturbed. So, the electromagnetic field is itself an entity that exists even in a vacuum that can actually suffer disturbances. So, the electromagnetic field is not made of matter, it is just an abstract construct, but it always exists even in a vacuum and that uh, electromagnetic field can suffer disturbances which can then propagate and those uh, disturbances are, are what we call light. So, just like in the case of solid, uh, you can have sound waves which you can treat classically, but when you treat them quantum mechanically, you get these quanta of sound. In fact, these are called phonons by the way. See the quanta of sound waves which we got here, this, this sort of thing. So, this is, these are called phonons. Phonons is basically the quantum mechanical description of sound. So, just like you could do that, you should be able to using this procedure that I just outlined, namely start with classical 8.20 and then uh, recast that quantum mechanically and uh, you should be able to study the electromagnetic waves quantum mechanically. So, that means you should be able to study photons just like phonons, the subscript on refers to the quantum mechanical version of the classical starting point. So, in a way phone on, phone means sound. So, it is a prefix which represents sound. On is a suffix that represents uh, quantization. So, sound quanta or phonons. So, similarly photon, on is basically the quantum description. Photo is light. So, photon would be the quantum description of light. So, uh, bottom line is that is what we should be successful in doing if we start with the classical 8.20, but then now reinterpret the generalized coordinate A as being uh, not a number, but as an operator and the generalized momentum also as an operator obeying these commutation rules, namely 8.21 and 22. So, just like uh, we were able to finally write down the Hamiltonian of sound waves in terms of uh, these modes. So, you have the energy of modes and then you have these quanta of excitation. So, this is the number of quanta with uh, wave number q. Here also we expect in a very similar vein we should be able to write this. So, now of course, there is an additional index j simply because uh, this uh, you see in this particular problem it was one dimensional. So, there was uh, no room for any further index. So, that it was just a one dimensional chain of mass spring, mass spring, mass spring. But here in the electromagnetic field is three dimensional. So, you expect one more index at least. So, and that is what that is. So, the bottom line is that we are going to postulate uh, canonically that you should have these, these commutators, these A's should obey these commutators. Now, of course, uh, I mean there is an implication that uh, you, you know you put stuff in a box so that k's become discrete. Now, you know that if you have a particle in a box, your uh, position is continuously from can change from 0 to L within the box, but the momentum is n pi by L where momentum k is discrete or the wave wave vector is discrete. So, that is why you, you have a chronicle delta when you are dealing with the, so this is true whether regardless of whether the underlying particle is a photon or a material particle, basically it is just one quantum particle in a box, you would immediately have a k that is quantized. Uh, so, the, that is the underlying mental picture that you have a radiation trapped in a box, uh, maybe a cubicle box of side L. So, therefore, the K has become discrete. All right. So, so if you uh, allow me these, uh, these kinds of optimistic uh, assertion, then I can go ahead and recast my Hamiltonian. So, I, I do the same thing I did earlier. So, I want to be able to rewrite the A's in terms of the P's and the A, I mean the, the, the creation 
the annihilation operators lower case a in terms of the generalized coordinate upper case a a bold face that means the vector potential. So, I should be able to write the annihilation operator in terms of the vector potential and the corresponding generalized momentum which is basically the electric field. So, uh, I will allow you to go through this algebra which is uh, tedious but straightforward and you can just go ahead and maybe should I spend some time perhaps not. Yeah, it's, it's just tedious and but straightforward. So, you will and eventually be able to if you follow this uh, uh, somewhat messy algebra, you will immediately be able to show that this uh, the annihilation operators are linearly related to the A's and P's. So, that means just like you know in the case even for the one mass and one spring, A was just uh, some constant into X plus some other constant into P. So, that is what even here you have the same thing. The annihilation operator for a photon is related to the generalized coordinate times some something some constant plus generalized momentum into some other constant, but then uh, you have to add up over all the positions because now you have a field instead of just one mass and one spring you have a field actually. So, you have to integrate or basically you have to add up all the degrees of freedom, you should not miss all that any of the degrees of freedom. So, we will be able to show we have shown uh, in the earlier steps that these commutators can be the R, R dependence and uh, can be extracted out this way and uh, so you can simply rewrite uh, so the R dash dependence can be extracted out because this depends on R dash in only in this way. Okay. So, you will be able to do that and uh, eventually what you will be able to show is basically that uh, this omega, okay. so this omega will come out as, so the, uh, so the important thing is that energy, so what will that energy be? So, it will actually, so this is a unit vector, so if you just take the modulus of both sides, so this omega will come out as uh, C h bar k. So, basically that is what this is, it is C p. So, this is C p. So, that is what uh, we expect for light. So, we expect the energy to be uh, proportional to uh, the momentum, right. So, we expect energy to be C p. So, that is what we expect for massless particles and we know that photons are massless particles. So, we get that. So, uh, bottom line is that, uh, so you get that and you are also able to express the generalized coordinate in terms of the annihilation operators and uh, similarly the electric field. So, the bottom line is that uh, you are able to now account for the fact. So, now you have a rigorous mathematical description of the electromagnetic field in terms of quanta. So, so that was uh, what Einstein suspected all along that there should be a consistent mathematical description of the electromagnetic field in terms of uh, quanta rather than in terms of electromagnetic waves. So, there was this earlier wave description and you can always rework that uh, wave description in terms of uh, quanta. So, of course, you might be thinking that you know that does that mean that the wave description has now completely been proven wrong? Uh, the answer is no, because you see uh, we know that uh, say if you have a projectile, say if you have a cricket ball and you throw it from your you know four boundary uh, towards uh, say uh, some bowler. So, it will uh, you know it will move in a parabolic trajectory. Uh, until it reaches the hands of the bowler. So, now uh, that uh, parabolic trajectory is perfectly described by uh, classical mechanics. So, it is described by Newton's second law and the trajectory and all that. So, whereas uh, uh, we know that that is uh, still an approximate description of nature. So, so the question is if you study the motion of the ball quantum mechanically that means if you write down the wave function of that ball and you find a rate at which uh, means you solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation for the wave function of the ball. Uh, 
are you able to also recover the same results that you get from uh, studying uh, the motion of the ball as a projectile in using uh, Newton's second law? The answer is yes, but it is rarely done in the books, but you can actually show that you get the same answers, uh, especially because the ball is macroscopically large. Uh, I mean, the Planck's constant is overwhelmingly small compared to the corresponding dimensions of an actual cricket ball. So, as a result, uh, the classical description is overwhelmingly accurate. So, the quantum description is uh, almost, I mean, it is completely superfluous except conceptually. So, you can uh, actually rework or re-derive uh, Newton's second law starting from Schrodinger equation. I know that that should be properly described in the quantum mechanics courses, but uh, many uh, instructors do not spend enough time proving that or explaining that carefully and uh, that is probably worth doing uh, at some stage. But uh, it can be done, you can show that uh, the motion of a projectile can be thought of as the solution of a Schrodinger equation also. So, similarly here, the uh, mere fact that we have described the quantum electromagnetic field in terms of photons does not mean that the uh, classical description has now been invalidated. So, the Young's double slit experiment, this Huygens uh, and uh, Fraunhofer diffraction, all those things continue to be valid for the same reason why the projectile motion. Uh, is still a valid description of uh, how a cricket ball moves in a cricket field, uh, even though it is being described using the imperfect uh, classical mechanics. So, even though uh, the correct theory of nature is quantum mechanics, uh, you will still get an overwhelmingly accurate description of a motion of a projectile by studying it classically. Similarly, it is only under very special circumstances that will force you to study the electromagnetic field quantum mechanically. So, for the most part, uh, you can get away by pretending that the electromagnetic waves are actually, I mean the electromagnetic field, the disturbances in the electromagnetic field are actually waves and those waves carry continuous amount of energy. So, with the only situation where that description is breaks down, just like in the case of projectile, it breaks down when the, uh, the mass in question is microscopic. So, similarly here also, it breaks down when the intensity of light is extremely small, so that uh, the wave description uh, becomes less and less accurate and the photon description becomes more and more accurate. So, then the individual packets of light uh, actually uh, start to matter. So, if you, so it is just like you know if you have a uh, water gushing out of your faucet from your tap, it is really silly to think of uh, the water that is coming out of your tap as made of water molecules. It is better to think of that as a fluid that is coming out. But however, if only a small number of molecules of water come out, I mean if the tap is like say has a diameter of the size of microns or even less, then you cannot ignore the fact that water is made of molecules because then actually one molecule after another will come out rather than water coming out. So, you cannot ignore the fact that molecules come out rather than just a fluid of water. So, similarly with light also, if, uh, if the intensity of light is very large, you can simply ignore the uh, wave, I mean you can ignore the quantum nature of light, you can ignore the fact that it is made of photons, but if if you turn down the intensity then then light comes one after, I mean the quanta of light arrives at the detector one after another and the discrete nature of light of the electromagnetic field becomes quite apparent. Okay, so, I am going to stop now. So, the mathematical details are important and in fact, the mathematical details also show you that uh, there are two modes of polarization. That means, that in the case of uh, electromagnetic field in free space, you have light that propagates in a certain direction and the uh, 
electric and magnetic fields point in a perpendicular direction and the perpendicular direction is a plane so it has two independent directions so those are the directions of polarization anyway so those are also there in classical description of the electromagnetic field and they carry over to the quantum description which is why you have this additional index j which actually represents the two polarization directions okay so in the next class i am going to be describing the uh, creation and so it, what all did i do just now so i described the creation and annihilation operator first of all for one mass tied to one spring then i described the creation and annihilation operator treatment of a system of mass tied to a spring followed by another mass then spring so that was supposed to be a, a caricature or representation of a one dimensional crystalline sol solid so the the basically the uh, description of uh, that system in terms of creation and annihilation operator basically meant that i was describing phonons that is the quantum description of sound waves that are propagating in that solid so then uh, today's class i explained how to study a very similar system but namely electromagnetic field in terms of a quantum creation and annihilation operator description so that would correspond to describing the quanta of the electromagnetic field which are called photons and uh, i explained how the energy contained in the electromagnetic field is discrete and uh, how to uh, write the quantum electric and magnetic field in terms of these creation and annihilation operators so in the next class i will continue in a similar vein but i will be studying uh, not uh, these uh, fields like electromagnetic field and uh, f sound waves rather i will think of creating and annihilating not excitations so till now i was creating and annihilating excitations that means excitations uh, corresponding to this harmonic oscillator excitations so the mass was still one mass and one spring that was not going away but it's the excitations that i can create or destroy so similarly photons are excitations of the electromagnetic field that can spontaneously appear or disappear so however you can also have a situation where you create and annihilate material particles so that is a somewhat an unusual reinterpretation of creating and annihilating so in the next class i will explain in what sense that has any relevance that uh, why would we want to create and annihilate material particles and in what circumstances are they important Okay so I'm going to stop here now I hope you will join me for the next class thank you mm -hmm.